You're listening to the Simply Flawsome Show, a podcast designed for you to listen, learn, and leverage. Please welcome your host, Zoe Turner. Hey everyone, JP here, and I'm with my friend Zoe Turner in Dubai. I'm actually on her podcast right now. As you can see, I don't usually have one of these mics, but we've been trying to get this podcast together for, oh, well, since September, and uh, there's, we have a lot of synchronicities, perfect time to say that. Uh, we have similar energies, so I'm looking forward to this conversation, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in her world, in her environment, but I just wanted to share it with you, so uh, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you, JP. My intention for today's chat with JP is to really talk about his journey over the last year. A few other questions thrown in there too, but really more about your journey, what you've been through, the lessons that you've learned from it. First of all, for my audience, for the people listening to the podcast who have not heard of you, don't know who you are, you've been in Dubai, you've been doing an event with Najari. Can you tell us a little bit about that event before we go into to what happened to you last year? Yeah, so first of all, uh, it's Najahi events, and they really are my family. Najahi stands for my success, and they are the number one facilitator for personal development events in the UAE. And I'm one of their speakers, and I was doing a workshop, a two-hour workshop, for a bigger event where I'm speaking. So it was a, an intro to the value and an intro to the bigger program, where I will be speaking alongside Ken Alicia Minkus, Les Brown and Ona Brown, Dr. John Martini, John Asaraf, and Lisa Nichols. Uh, so that's why I, why I was here. But the reason why I was able to make it work was because I was also coming not only as an educator and a teacher, I was coming to Dubai to be a student. So you and I are both on the same course right now, which is how we were able to make this happen. And that's what I love about you, the fact that you are always following your journey over the last year, and especially after your accident. One thing I've noticed that you've been going a lot, a lot to educational events. You know, so how important is education? to you I actually put something on social media the other day I don't know if you saw it and I said you're only as good as a teacher as you are a student or you're only as good a teacher as you are a student I don't speak that good England so I'm you know I I don't want to sound like speakery there's no reason why I am why I am today or why I have spoken in 15 countries and coached amazing people other than I was committed to to making it happen, I was committed to myself. I heard something today that Dr. Joe Dispenza said, and he said it's you showing up for you or something like that, you showing up for yourself. And that's all I've ever done is showed up for myself. So I never wanna get to stagnant, to plateau. And for that reason, I keep showing up for myself in the areas of self and situational awareness. Awareness is what we need to change. If you're not aware, you can't change anything. So I'm always seeking awareness, through education. Has the, the importance of education been highlighted more to you since your accident? Have you needed that mentally? Yes. My recovery from my accident was looked at as miraculous. Ex- Going back, I think we should actually tell people what's happened. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So, so yeah, they, they know. Yeah. Our audience will know, but my audience. Yes. So, I have been in sport and fitness my whole life. I've always liked doing physical challenges. It started when I was a teenager. I cycled 200 miles. Then it was the Great Wall of China. Then it was Thai boxing in Thailand. And I want to say this year in 2019, I decided to cycle from the north to the south of England, sorry, the UK. So going through Scotland, touching on Wales and going to the bottom of England. And I was on eighth day, 800 and something miles. And I was hit head on uh, by a an unfit to drive driver let's just say that um because it's still very much going on and uh, i broke my legs in multiple places i flew 100 meters off the side of the road got stopped by a tree my bike was shattered in 20 pieces Uh, i had a punctured lung heart trauma perforated bowel broken arm snapped twice snap femur snap shin three times doctor said you you're very lucky to be alive but To go back to what I was saying, my recovery was seen as something remarkable and wow. And people like, oh, you're recovering too fast. Like, you you know, it's been five months. You shouldn't be where you are. My lawyers said to me that are handling my case, said, JP, we're not kidding you that in seven months, you are recovered more than anyone we've ever had as a client. Usually people are where you are two years after an accident, but it's not a coincidence. It's because of everything I've learned my whole life. Like, 
I swear my, my wife must get so annoyed with me because I'm always learning. I'm always studying. If I'm at home, I have a YouTube video on, a podcast on, an audio um, book on. I'm always, always learning. So to be able to take or already to, to be able to be committed to learning because I understand the importance of it, but then to be put in a situation where you're deep in a valley, deep in a challenge and be able to rely on those tools to a point that even when you were close to your death, you have no uncertainty about your recovery. That just reminded me that, hey, I just got to keep studying. But one thing that was missing from my life was I teach self-mastery. That's what I've done my whole, from personal trainer to coach, life coach, peak performance, how to master yourself. But for most of my adult life, I've taught mind and body. But I knew that my next evolution was in heart, heart mastery. That's why I did the Vipassana meditation. That's why I'm here with you at Dr. Joe Dispenza at an event called Higher Love. Because that for me is my next, I added to my question or your question, but that for me is the next level of education is being able to not just transform people's bodies and minds, but heal their hearts. Why is it important to heal your heart? Why have you gone from mind and body to heart healing? Because I'm going to say the blanket version, which is you can push your mind and have the best body in the world. If you still have wounds from your past, you'll never truly leave them behind. So that's a true fact, right? You can, you can look it up. Um, you can look into healing and you know, emotional trauma. But also I know that from my own personal experience. I, I truly believe this, that I had to have that accident because I was very good at being successful, inspiring from stage. I've had a great physique my whole life because I always train. I can push my body and my mind, but I always kept myself very, very, very busy because if I wasn't busy, I'd have to think about everything that I was suppressing. So many people listening to this will resonate with this. As long as you're busy being busy, or even busy being successful, you don't have to feel that much. So over the last six, seven years, I've started to slowly get into meditation, into yoga, and the more I slow down, the more I was able to see the truth. Truth has become one of my highest values today. To explain slowing down and seeing the truth, I have a story or an example that I use. Imagine you know, doing the Virgin train or any fast bullet train and you're going from London to Manchester. It's an amazing experience. Even if you're sitting in first class, which I love to do, you feel amazing and you know where you're going and you're traveling fast and you've got all the nice clothes on, but you can't see what's really going on around you because everything's a blur because you're so focused on your work or you know your your next meal coming or you know where you've got to get your next meal or finishing as much work as you can before you get your meeting it isn't until you slow down or even the train breaks down and stops and sits still i.e. meditation right this is a metaphor for life that you can actually see the truth which is what's going on around you and how do you feel if you're not heading anywhere yeah can i ask you a question this is something that i was thinking about the other day and um it's just come to me now. Do you think that endurance sport can be a mask for emotional problems? Because, li because like yourself, I was, I, I get, look, I wasn't a great athlete, but I, I, I did a lot of endurance, a lot of marathons, um, you know, every weekend from ever since I moved to Dubai and before that, I moved to Dubai in 2010. Friday, Saturday, you know, I'm up at four, five, six o'clock doing like long races and you don't give your body chance to slow down because it's just bang, bang, bang. And the time that you are recovering, you're just mentally exhausted. I became addicted to that mental exhaustion. And like, I didn't feel that I truly worked out unless, you know, I mean, it's a great feeling. Don't get me wrong. It's a wonderful feeling. You know, you can eat a pizza or you can watch three movies, you can do a hat trick and, you know, you feel like you've earned it, you know? Doesn't really enable you to, I'm not sure if I'm explaining this properly, but it, it, I don't think it enables you to slow down and really kind of feel things. And it was only when I stopped training excessively um, a couple of years ago, obviously training's always going to be in your heart and, yeah. and, and soul if you've done it a lot, but it's only then that I feel that I'm connecting more with my true self. So, I mean, you didn't even need to elaborate on that. What you said before was, do you think that endurance sports or any hardcore sports um, is a way for you masking what's really going on? The answer is it can be. 
Yes, absolutely. So w for anyone that's doing for anyone that's doing a lot of sport, I would recommend this. Ask yourself when you're not in sport, how do you feel? That's a very important question because if you feel like you need like exercise makes me feel good, but when I'm not exercising, I generally feel good too. I love speaking, I love doing podcasts, mm -hmm. I love doing Facebook lives. So it I don't have to be in fitness all the time. But when I had my accident, I'm sure you were aware of who David Goggins is. Of course. Okay, so the the most extreme iron person in the world uh, is this guy named David Goggins. David Goggins, an ultra, 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 ultra endurance athlete. Four weeks after my accident, sorry, four weeks after I uh, left hospital, something like that. A few weeks, I was still on a lot of morphine. But I knew that David was coming to London to speak for the very first time and I had to get there. Anyway, I pumped loads of morphine and gabapentin in my body and I got a, a ride to London in a car. I had a wheelchair waiting for me and I went, I was able to get to an event with David Goggins, stayed just for his talk, not the two days, just stayed for an hour. And then I was able to go into a conference room like the one we're in right now and I had a sit down with David. I was gifted it from my, my friend, Nick James. He gifted me a one to a one to one really with David Goggins, even though there were other people there, and I was able to share my story. And David Goggins said to me this, because I, I my question to him was, I want to go and you know show the world how you know how you can turn this around, how I can turn this around. It can be inspiring, and you know I want to do an Ironman in four months. Have you got any advice for me? How can I you know be David Goggins in this in my attitude um, and recover super quick? And he said to me, not what I thought. He said, JP, you're like me. He said, your fuel is fitness. It's your medicine. Mm -hmm. He said, you know all these stories about me, the ultra runs, the broken shins, the broken feet, taping my feet to my shins so I could keep running. But what you don't know is between those ex ex extraordinary v events, I would spend three years, five years, six years, uh, six years at one point, not doing anything. So you, go, you see me doing these amazing things, but there were times where I couldn't do anything. And he said, let me tell you something. That's who I figured out who I really was. And that was, he said, do this. He said, set challenges, but don't put a date on it. He said, right now, t he said, stop taking the medicine. And excuse my language. Can I use David Goggins' language? No? Okay. He said, then you'll see who you really fucking are. And that was like in my throat because I knew he was right. Mm. I've always done this stuff. So let me see who I am. And actually, you know, if David ever watches this or Nick James ever watches this or listens to this, I just want to say thank you because that was the greatest advice that I needed because it made me slow down and stop and realize that, hey, for me, the next level is growing my heart, not my body, not my mind. And that's all I've been doing this year. And, oh, I mean... It's been beautiful. It has been beautiful. Um, and I've changed as a person. So short answer, it can be a way for people to block out what's really going on. So my question to you as a coach, anyone listening, would be, do you need to feel good? Or do you need to do exercise to feel good? Or do you just enjoy doing it? And if you only feel good when you do exercise, you should really s speak to someone about that. Go to an event, see a coach, get a mentor, or whatever, because that's a problem, you know. You shouldn't need an experience or an external environment outside of yourself to feel good. I think we're all, we are specifically talking more about kind of endurance here, I think, aren't we? So there's like exercise and there's endurance. Like endurance is yeah. kind of, you know, kind of the crazy exercise, isn't it? You know, yeah, so, hours, so basically... But I think it's still important to cultivate energy on yeah. a daily basis. Oh, no, it sorry. could be a half an hour yeah, walk. What, or what I mean is long periods of exercise. Mm. So like two hours of running every day or three hours of swimming or anything, anything long. And yeah. you keep going, keep going, keep going because you just want those endorphins yeah. to keep, you know, firing up your brain or, you know, yeah. 
your pineal gland yeah. you know, to keep firing. I'm getting excited. You're just talking about it. I really, I do miss endurance. I miss that. That for me, it was that mental. You know, my mate used to say to me, "I trained with him." I never did comrades, but I used to train with my mate who ran comrades every year, and I used to do the long 30k runs with him. And he'd often say to me, "Zoe, you kick in at 15k," and I was like. I know. So we're getting to 15k where most people are tired. I'm like, I know, I love it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the second wind comes like two hours. Yeah, yeah. So, JP. To, to flip that around, sorry, mm-hmm. can I just say, to anyone that has a mental or emotional situation and you want to find a solution, it's get into momentum, get moving. It really works. I'll put my hand up and say, I'm not saying it's healthy, but I'm saying I've got through so much suffering by getting out of my own way and putting my shoes on, metaphorically and literally speaking, and going for a run. It's really fueled me, but you know, it's a short, it's a short-term fix. You can't do it forever. Yeah, 100%. Dr. Joe says gratitude is the ultimate state of receivership. (laughs) What are you grateful for today? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, What I'm grateful to, uh, what I'm grateful for is honestly being here, being here in this experience. We're in a seven day, fully, fully immersive, um, heart altering, heart opening experience with Dr. Joe Dispenza in Dubai. And it just makes me feel very grateful to be alive. Obviously, you know, my accident took my gratitude to another level. And, you know, it's so unfortunate that we need to experience death to be reminded of life um, or how grateful we are for life. But it did happen to me. But I'm also very gifted that most people know that a near-death experience changes people. So I now have a gift as a teacher, as an educator, as a speaker, that 9.99.999% of the world will never ever have. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful to be able to share it here with you. I'm grateful to be able to share it with people at my own events and in my coaching. And so I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for this event. I'm grateful to be alive. It's definitely happened for a reason with you. You know, you were equipped with all of these skills to be able to kind of assist you with your recovery but it's also like you say it's taken your skills to the next level as well and you've already got a platform to inspire to help others and you know for you to share your experience with your audience is going to help so many people Mm -hmm. and I think just people watching your journey you know like I've watched it on Instagram like you know I think we've felt your pain with you you know when you've been trying to get up off your chair and seeing you go into these events and you know seeing that you're in a lot of pain and you know it's been you know it's it's been kind of Oh, you know, at times it's been uncomfortable watching the pain, you know, probably not as uncomfortable as your situation, but, you know, it's so inspiring to see and to see you come out the other side. But even more so, it's very, it's great to see you have that spark in you, that glint in your eye, you know, which I've seen during this, that smile and that glint. And I don't know, it's just really nice, nice thing to see. Thank you so much. Uh, I would say, uh, yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Uh-huh. The reason why I have the glint, the smile, my heart wide open is because my life has never been about me. And some people might not even understand that, never mind argue that. Uh, but from when I was a kid, you know, at 10 years old, I almost went to foster care. We were getting food hampers every Friday from my auntie. Uh, I was wearing my older cousin's clothes. My younger brothers were in my clothes. Like things were tough. But there was a moment when I was 10 years old that I'll never, ever forget. And it was the first moment of like uh, me being connected to God or the universe uh, or source. And it was me giving my, my lunch sandwich from school, a white bread sandwich with strawberry jam in tinfoil, giving it to a homeless man. And it just it just I just can't describe it I can tell you exactly where we were sitting the color of the grass the, what he was wearing um, and I've always lived my life uh, to serve others uh, and as an altruist I am an altruist I don't not at the expense of myself you know I won't go that far because for me to lead and serve to the highest degree I need to take care of myself um, but I definitely live an altruistic life in that I live for others and I do everything that I can for others and to help others so when I woke up in intensive care after two weeks and I knew that I was going to be on a journey 
I just made a decision that this is not about me. It's about everyone else. I know that people are watching me from all over the world and, you know, teenage kids that have legs missing and people in their 30s that have had uh, bad car accidents. And, you know, I now have a new ability to influence people. I've been through emotional stuff, financial stuff, but I've never been through a physical challenge. So I thought, oh, how awesome. Now I can help physical cha physically challenge people too. Thank you, universe. Um, so that just made me really excited. My reach, my ability to inspire and influence and, and make, a, make a footprint in the world just went up like a whole nother notch. Yeah. Thank you. You've already spoken about how near-death experiences um, are very profound. And a lot of people when they're, they're placed or they're in a situation like that, you know, they, um, they turn to kind of higher sources. Did it... You know, you were a religious man. Did it, you know, did it kind of, were you thinking about, did you ever think about God or anything like that? So, good questions. So, first of all, no, I'm not a religious man. But way before this accident, I, I grew up as a Baptist Christian. But when I was 13 years old, my younger brother said, I, I don't believe that this is how it is. And that made, I just was told that this is how, you know, life is. You, this is, you know, heaven, hell, burning in fire, all that stuff. And, and when my brother started to question that, I st thought, okay, hang on. If he's questioning whether it's true or not, I, I started to question it. And then I, when I was 20, I moved to the UK and I experienced all different religions, all different cultures. And I, and I thought, who's right and who's wrong? And then I thought, hang on, if I lived in the UK... If I was born in the UK with a twin brother and my mother had to give us up for adoption, which my real mother almost did when we were 10, and my brother and I got, um, at one years old, got separated and I moved to uh, Iran or whatever, Iraq, and, and some kind of Arab country, and my brother stayed in the UK, we could potentially end up wanting to kill each other just because of, uh, because of rules or conditioning that we've been told. So when I realized that, I thought, it doesn't make sense to me, but I understand faith. And I think it's everyone in the world has to have faith, whether it's um, Mother Nature, whether it's the divine, whether it's God, Allah, Buddha, Krishna. Um, it doesn't matter who you follow. I think it's important to understand that life is more than you because if you're in yourself, you'll always feel separated. You'll never feel connected to something greater. And connection is the, the number one uh, value or um, need that we have as human beings. You need to feel connected to something. That's why if someone doesn't have connection in their life, you can pull them to um, crime, to gangsterism, if that's a word, to extreme, ex you know, extreme uh, activities, because what they find in that is a sense of connection. So I thought, okay, faith is very important, but the rules behind religion cause separation. So it caused you to say, we're here and you're over there. So I became fascinated with the religion. I've studied a little bit the Quran. Um, I still look at the Bible. I've studied the Tao and the 81 verses of the Tao. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm very much into Buddhism because really Buddhism is just a way of life. It's just saying this is how we choose to live, to be grateful, to not harm others, to be respectful, to not lie, to speak truthfully. So I'm not religious, but I'm very spiritual and I, I'm fascinated by all religions. And I want to live in a world one day when I can sit with a Buddhist and my Islam brother or sister and, um, and you know, a Hare Krishna, and we can all sit and be respectful of each other's faiths, but at the same time feel like we're one because we are one. We all come from the same place. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm conscious of time. So Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. How long have we been chatting? Oh, 20, oh, it says 27 on there. How long have we been recording on your Facebook? Hi, everybody. Uh, it's, uh, we've lost connection now, unfortunately. Oh, have we? You're not live anymore? Uh, no, it's still live. It's just, it'll, it'll come back. But, okay. Um, I think about half an hour, I'm sure. Uh, okay. Yeah, do you want to ask another question? Yeah. Sorry, we actually, we need to be heading somewhere out after this. So. I, I would like to ask another question, and I know the answer to this, but it's a question I would like to ask you. Do you fit, think that it's possible to heal yourself with the mind? <laughs> and I'm being more specific about your situation. Like you've experienced some really um, challenging injuries that, like, like you say, the lawyers say, you know, any normal person, it would take them a long time to recover. You know, 
do you think it's possible to to heal your body with your mind? So uh, I do think it's possible. I think it's more importantly, I think it's a must. I think if you're just waiting to heal yourself physically, you're you're not going to make the most of that healing. To get to a breakthrough, sometimes you need to get to a breakdown. And so I truly believe that an injury can be one of your greatest gifts because it allows you time to rebuild yourself, but in a stronger way where you're, abs- you're conscious. You know, you, when you're born into this world, you don't, you know, you're just born into this world. You don't have a decision to say, you know, I'm going to focus on, you know, having really strong legs or having a really strong gut, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think if you if you get ill, if you break something, this is an opportunity for you to create an incredible breakthrough, but you have to do it by paying attention to what you're going through. You know, people say focus on your healing or focus on your recovery. For me, there's two meanings to focus. Or there's two, focus is a two-part focus. <laughs> focus is a two-part focus. One is intention. And that's the desired outcome that you wish to have. So my intention is to get fully healed, back to being an Ironman, back to, you know, being an athlete, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the first part of focus is intention. Be very, very clear on your intention. And intention doesn't come from your body. It comes from your mind. You have to take the intention and place it in your body, in your mind, in your heart, and say, this is what I want, this is who I want to be, this is what I want to have. Then once you have the intention very clear, you then have to go to the second part of focus, which is attention. And then you just stay in your attention. Now, attention can be your next move, right? Like Martin Luther King Jr. said, you don't have to see the whole staircase. You just have to take the next step or the first step. So your attention, once your intention is clear in your mind, you then have to take one step at a time towards that intention. So, you know, it it has to be in the mind, your transformation and your recovery and um, your healing. But also your attention could be on something that we've been so immersive in this week, which is meditation, Mm -hmm. which is your breath, you know, focusing on the areas that you need to heal. So once again, when you say, you know, change your, heal yourself or change your body through your mind, it's not just using some personal development trick or tool. It's actually saying, in my case today, I did a meditation earlier. And unfortunately, where I broke my femur, I had a metal rod put in from my hip. So they went through the top of my hip bone, uh, sorry, my, my um, thigh bone. And they put a metal rod all the way through my bone down to my knee. And then there's two screws at the bottom. And I don't know how, but these screws have started to agitate my leg. And my leg is completely swollen right now. Mm-hmm. Like, if you feel that, feel that lump. Yeah. And that's just started to act up this morning. So I said, okay, I need healing here. Mm-hmm. But if I'm not putting my mind on this or my heart on this, you know, depending on how spiritual you are, I can't expect it to heal. And I also don't want to focus on it with my mind in a negative way. Ah, woe is me. Oh, you know, this proves I'll never get back to who I used to be. So all I did was I said, okay, my intention is to heal my leg. So my attention for the next hour is going to be sending positive energy through my body. And I can give example after example after example. But the short answer to your question is, You should aim to go into your mind first to heal your body or your heart or your emotions or your wounds. And then you should say, okay, what is my desired outcome for my healing? What is it? Do you just want to heal to be average or do you want to turn your life around through your healing? What's the intention? Get very clear on that. Be able to write it out on a blackboard or a whiteboard. And then once that's clear, you know it. You don't need to go back to it anymore. Then go to the second part of focus, which is attention and say, where do I need to put my mind today? for me to go through this healing and then do it one day at a time you change this is a great quote of mine that's very well known you change your life one day at a time thank you jp